so everybody knows. Yep. Thank you, Caitlin. We are going to be recording this conversation. Just want to make sure everybody is aware. And that's for us to uh, make this available to folks who couldn't join us live. Um, and let's see. Uh, let me check in with uh, Keith to make sure that his connection is good. And as soon as I get a okay from him, we'll do, we can, uh, we can get started. Last call for bio breaks or coffee breaks or anything you need to do. Hi, Patty. It, Patty, you're muted if you're speaking. I know that uh, Keith was having a hard time with uh, the connection in one part of in the room that he was in. So he was switching rooms. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. How's everybody doing this morning? Ms. Luella Kenny, I have to say it's a pleasure and an honor to mm -hmm. see you on here. Thank you for making the time. It's my pleasure very much. And um, it's very important. And also I'd like to say that I found that uh, many of the small bookstores they have not been made aware of this book. And, and my experience right now is that two of our small bookstores here in Buffalo, New York have gotten the book because of our conversation. So if you're looking to, to get the book, check with your local small bookstore and, and they get excited and they start mailing it. And um, in fact, I'm, I'm doing a presentation next week at one of our local small bookstores. But it's great to be here and great that the story is finally out. Can you guys hear me yet? Yep, we got you. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I totally agree um, with uh, Luella because we, so here in DC, we have uh, an amazing bookstore called Politics and Prose. Uh, if you're in DC or if you're not sure where to get the book, you can definitely get it from there or from the, the link that uh, Caitlin dropped in the chat. Um, and this definitely a great thing to do at this time is to support local bookstores who were, uh, a lot of whom have really struggled, right, during the pandemic. And it's, uh, it's, it's a, just a hard thing to run an independent bookstore in this day and age. So we definitely recommend that you do that. Um, I, uh, I have to say, I, I went to, uh, the event here live in Washington, D.C. with uh, Keith and Lois was there and so many others. And the um, uh, just the opportunity to be in person with people again and uh, uh, to hear Keith talk about the book was really great. Um, I invited him to do this over Zoom for, you know, some of our friends and um, and supporters and he graciously agreed. Keith O'Brien is a, an incredible writer and we have gotten, it's such a treat to have this amazing story told by him. Um, I love the book. I think it's amazing. Um, and Keith, I can't thank you enough for, for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me, Gustavo. And it's so great to be here. So great to see some familiar faces, Luella and Lois and Patty. It's good to see you guys out there. Good to see you. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I, without further ado, Gustavo, I'll, I'll get started if, if that works sure. for you. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, you know, I'll, I've got a little slideshow that I'll, I'll be able to share here, hopefully, and and um, uh, I provide a little bit of color to 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 the Zoom. Um, so uh, maybe I'll. Um, 
just for starters, start by saying it is really great to be here. Thanks, Gustavo, for having me, Lois and Luella. Patty, so great to see you. Um, and, and for others who, who are coming to this story, um, you know, uh, you, you may be coming at it from different perspectives or, or different knowledge bases. Uh, some of you may know this story very well, uh, others less so. Uh, I guess I'll tell you, you know, what, what, what I, uh, fr from my perspective, what um, is, I found so compelling. And then I, I will we'll open it up for, for a little Q&A here um, with Gustavo. So let me get my um, screen shared here with the beauty of modern technology. Uh, is, is that working on your end, guys? Gustavo, can you see the images? Yep, it's perfect. Yep. Fantastic. So, um, so we're going to talk today uh, about the book. We're going to talk about uh, you know, one of the great uh, environmental crises of the 20th century. Uh, how it emerged, what happened there, uh, you know, why it still matters today. Uh, and, and, and I'm gonna to talk to you in, in great deal about um, the ordinary folks, and they were primarily mothers, who pushed this story into the spotlight, and, and in doing so almost by accident, ended up changing the world. Uh, to me, this is a story of resistance. This is a story of epic proportions. Uh, in the span of about two years, uh, these folks, again, mostly mothers, uh, would go from being ignored by their local school officials in Niagara Falls to having the ear of Jimmy Carter in the White House. And, and they would find themselves staring down uh, uh, one of the most powerful businessmen in America and, and prevailing. That, that is the story of, of Paradise Falls. Uh, but before we get into that big story, uh, I, I wanted to start uh, with, with a smaller moment, uh, a behind the scenes moment from my reporting. I wanted to begin today uh, with the story of a bird. Now, in one of my very first interviews for, for this book, I, I spoke to Luella Kenny, who's, who's here in the Zoom. Uh, and you know, in the 1970s, uh, Luella was a mother of three boys uh, on the east side of Niagara Falls, who with her husband, Norman, had purchased a small home there on 96th Street. Uh, it was a, a little a red brick house, uh, and uh, um, it, it was uh, for the Kennys, you know, uh, a, a really a great place to grow up. Um, it was located uh, six miles due east of the waterfalls that most everyone knows. Um, six miles up the river on the edge of town uh, in, a, in a neighborhood uh, called LaSalle. Um, this was uh, a neighborhood of uh, a tidy grid of streets, um, uh, that, uh, of primarily starter homes. These were all single story ranchers, um, uh, but it was a, you know, a desirable place to live. These were um, uh, families, uh, who, who were scraping away to the middle class, uh, often on factory workers' wages. Uh, and, and they were primarily families with young children. And, and those children like to gather on a wide expanse of rectangular land that you can actually see here in these photographs um, that the, the kids simply called the playground. Now, the, the parents sometimes wondered why this land had never been fully developed, but the kids asked no questions because this was you know, a, a, an almost magical place for them. Uh, there was a school uh, in the heart of this land. Uh, there was an actual playground with play structures, a, a baseball diamond. Um, and, and on weekday afternoons or weekends, um, the children knew uh, they could find their friends here. This, this school and this playground actually um, in the heart of this neighborhood were one of the reasons why people wanted to move um, to this neighborhood. Uh, uh, but the Kennys had, had, a, had a, a, another reason too. Um, their home was located way up on the northern edge of this neighborhood. You can see there in that red circle um, uh, on 96th Street in an elbow turn there in the road, sort of in a modified cul-de-sac uh, uh, backed away from any road traffic. And, and it had a, a large backyard that you can make out there in the Google photographs uh, that rambled back into a, a confluence of creeks. Um, this was for the Kenny boys, a, a sort of paradise. You know, um, 
In, in, in summers, uh, they would uh, slosh through the waters of those creeks, crutching crawdads. Uh, in winters, they would actually skate on those creeks. And then uh, in 1978, problems began to emerge. You know, uh, you know, secrets long buried in this neighborhood began to seep out of the ground in ways uh, people had not seen before. Um, one of the Kenny boys uh, began to get sick uh, with a, 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 a mysterious set of symptoms that stumped local doctors. And, 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 and Luella Kenny, um, being a mother, um, began to focus all of her attention you know, on her son uh, and her house and her yard and those creeks. Uh, Luella began to wonder what was in the water. You know, in the months ahead, Luella would actually go out to the edge of those creeks and she would um, crouch down there and she would uh, keep a log. She would keep a journal of what she saw there. Uh, and a journal and a log that Luella actually kept her whole life uh, until she uh, ultimately shared it with me. And, and, and in this journal, you know, she, she wrote things like, you know, water level high, oil slicks, murky, orange appearance, odor permeates the air, oil slicks moving down creek, uh, deep orange appearance from uh, drain to part where major part of creek is starting, uh, odor is present in an entire backyard. And, and that brings me back to the story uh, of, of the bird. You know, sometimes in, in reporting and in research, uh, people say things to you uh, that, that seem uh, too fantastic, too sensational, uh, sometimes too good to be true. And, and, and the bird story for me is, is one of these moments. For Luella, it was just a memory. Uh, she said that um, she remembered being back at the edge of those creeks one day with a couple of scientists, two scientists. And she said um, um, that on this day, she turned away from the men at, at the creek's edge for a moment uh, to walk back from the house. And, and, and she heard them speaking in agitated tones. And one of them was then running up through the trees. Uh, he told her, she said that uh, he wished to store something in her freezer uh, because in that moment, a small songbird had landed at the edge of the creek. It had dipped its beak into the water, uh, the water that Luella was increasingly convinced uh, was contaminated and possibly even the source of her family's problems. And then the bird promptly toppled over. Uh, it was dead. So, you know, that story is something like 43 uh, years old. And, and, and for me, one of the challenges I faced with this book was uh, parsing fact from fiction, uh, truth from lies, in a story where um, so many uh, lied for so long. Uh, it, it took uh, over 130 hours worth of interviews, thousands of pages of documents, some documents that I had to re retrieve four decades later, only with a freedom of information request. And of course, I was doing all this work, you know, in the midst of, of, the, of the pandemic. Uh, so it, it was, um, you know, at times incredibly challenging. Uh, and, and it is a real pleasure to, to share it with you here today. Um, so I just want to give everybody a little bit of a framework for the story, some of the characters in this story, some of the characters right here in this Zoom. And, and then I'll be happy with Gustavo to take some questions from you all. Um, so, you know, when we think about Niagara Falls, People tend to think about it like this, you know, with the with the postcards and the and the waterfalls and the and the honeymooners and the crowds. Uh, but the real work of Niagara Falls uh, actually happens uh, just a couple miles away from that tourist destination. Um, you know, between the waterfalls and that neighborhood known as La Salle, uh, the river uh, looked like this. You know, it was dotted with uh, chemical plants in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, uh, Union Carbide was there, DuPont, Carborundum, uh, and there was a place uh, called Hooker Chemical. You know, at, at turns in the 20th century, Hooker is both the, the largest employer in Niagara Falls and, and the largest industrial taxpayer. Really, in, in many ways, Hooker keeps the lights on in Niagara Falls. It um, uh, funds the schools, it gives money to the varsity football teams and local artists, and, and of course um, does you know, good work 
you know, providing people with the chemicals that we need, whether we know it or not, the chemicals we use, whether we know it or not. Um, you know, in the, uh, uh, the metal uh, of our pans, in the uh, rubber of our sneakers, in the uh, fire retardant sofas and couches and carpets that are in our house. Uh, but most importantly, Hooker provided jobs. You know, at its peak, Hooker employed 3,000 people uh, just in Niagara Falls. Um, and if you were a man, in particular, if you were a white man, and it's worth noting that you did, by the way, in the middle part of the 20th century, have to be a white man, uh, you could make it all the way to the top at Hooker Chemical. You could have a big corporate title, a corner office, uh, you could fly on the corporate jet. And if you were really lucky, uh, you could fly on the jet with the man who acquired Hooker Chemical in 1968. Uh, he was uh, one of the wealthiest capitalists in America at the time, uh, with the most powerful lawyers at his beck and call. He was the chairman of Occidental Petroleum. Uh, that man's name was Armand Hammer. But for all the good work the hooker does, the jobs it provides, the profits it generates, the tax dollars it creates for the city of Niagara Falls, it also created its fair share of problems in the city, uh, at times alarming problems. Um, at that plant along the river, uh, workers were injured uh, with alarming regularity. Uh, and, and, and residents uh, living in the neighborhoods closest to the hooker plant often had to live in clouds of, of noxious fumes that wafted up or down the river. Workers also died at the hooker plant. Again, at times with alarming regularity in um, explosions, chemical fires, accidents that defied explanation. On at least two occasions in the 1960s, um, the manhole covers on Buffalo Avenue, that major uh, city thoroughfare right in front of Hooker, uh, the Hooker plant, popped and blew, uh, skittering into oncoming traffic like a giant Frisbees. And then, of course, uh, there were the secrets, uh, the secrets that Hooker buried in multiple places in the city of Niagara Falls, uh, but primarily in one place, uh, a rectangular stretch of land in the heart of a neighborhood uh, known as LaSalle. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, Hooker uh, acquired this land here and, 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 and began using it as a dump for its chemical wastes and residues. Uh, it was at the time an old ragged waterway, a canal uh, that, that a, a man had tried to carve as a cut, cut off uh, on, on, in the Niagara River a man named William T. Love, uh, the Love Canal. And, and, and it's important to note, I think, um, that, uh, uh, that this uh, canal um, was a problem uh, for Hooker and, and they knew it even from the start. Um, as early as 1946, um, uh, Hooker uh, uh, notes in internal memos uh, that they're in the embarrassing position of having used this property as a dump for three years without ownership or even permission. Um, but, but two days later, the top lawyer for, for Hooker Chemical uh, wrote a different memo to the same uh, group of executives in which he said that he had concerns that were even greater than permission or ownership of, of this canal, now a landfill. Um, this man was a lawyer. He was not a, a scientist. Uh, but he had been out to the site. He had seen it with his own eyes. And, and he reported uh, that it seemed to him uh, that it was contaminated. As he would write uh, that August, to my inexperience, it, I, it appears that the water is contaminated. And he'd seen children walking up to the lip of this old canal uh, with their bathing costumes in their hands. And based on all of these factors, uh, the lawyer determined that it seemed to him that Hooker was one, running a, quote, real hazard uh, on the east side of town. That was 1946. Uh, in 1952, six years later, um, those hazards had only grown. 
you know, in the post-war years, uh, Niagara Falls was booming, uh, as, as were many uh, urban centers in America at the time. Um, those chemical plants along the river were hiring more and more people. People were moving Ni to Niagara Falls for those jobs, and the population base was pushing east out toward that rural place called LaSalle, out toward that old canal. And of course, at that time, uh, there were far more chemical residues and waste in the ground uh, than there had been just a few years earlier. And, and I wanna just to mention a, a few of them uh, to you now. Um, there was something in the canal called thionyl chloride. Um, this was, uh, is a compound that not many people will recognize, uh, but it was a, a clear or pale yellowish liquid with a very irritating odor. Um, and it was dumped in the canal inside uh, 55 gallon drums. Uh, and, and while you may not recognize the, the chemical compound itself, you will recognize what it was used for. Uh, thionyl chloride is the fundamental element of mustard gas, uh, which uh, Hooker generated in great volumes uh, in the middle part of the 20th century. Um, there was something in the canal called lindane, uh, which was a, a white powder uh, which is uh, found in many pesticides and insecticides. And, and then there was something called 1245 tetrachlorobenzene, which again, isn't uh, something that most people uh, will, will recognize. Um, but uh, tetrachlorobenzene was known to create a byproduct um, that you might've heard of. Um, it, uh, tetrachlorobenzene is known to spawn dioxin. Uh, one of the most toxic substances known to science. And among other things, uh, dioxin was the fundamental element of Agent Orange, uh, the, the defoliant that uh, the US military used in, in, during Vietnam. So, um, uh, so these chemicals are in the ground, the population is pushing east, uh, and, and, and in 1952, uh, the city of Niagara Falls reaches out to Hooker with a proposition. Um, the Board of Education wants to um, uh, purchase this land, the old Love Canal, to use as a school uh, that would accommodate uh, that population based moving to the east side of town. And, you know, uh, of course, Hooker knows what's in the ground. And in early memos, internal memos in the spring of 1952, it dismisses this idea. Uh, as Hooker executives say that spring, uh, this land is not suitable for this purpose. But over the course of just three or four weeks, uh, the tone of these internal memos begins to change. And by the end of April 1952, top Hooker executives are now beginning to recognize that this might actually be an opportunity. As one of them notes in a memo, uh, the Love Canal property is rapidly becoming a liability for the company. And so despite its own misgivings, and in fact, at times, its own warnings to the Board of Education that they should not do this, uh, Hooker uh, does agree in the months ahead to transfer this land to the Board of Education for a dollar, uh, with the caveat written into the uh, legal language that the company would not be held liable for any future problems at this site. So up grows that school and around it grows this, this neighborhood right here, uh, uh, Luella Kenny, Lois Gibbs and, and, and Patty Grenzi's neighborhood. And, and I think it's important to note uh, that these problems, the problems in this neighborhood begin almost immediately. Um, Children in the neighborhood report uh, burns on their skin and in their eyes. Fires at times break out on this ground, small fires uh, for reasons uh, no one can explain. On at least one occasion, a buried drum of thionyl chloride, that fundamental element of mustard gas, uh, popped and blew, exploding beneath the ground as it reacted violently with water. Um, scattering its contents on, on nearby homes. And, and then there were stories that people told, stories that people told at the time and also told to me. Uh, in, in interview after interview, people said, especially kids 
who had grown up in the 1960s and 70s on this land said that they found rocks on this land uh, that would spontaneously combust, rocks that would catch fire. Now, of course, this also sounds insane and absurd, and, and, and it certainly could not be true. But again, in interview after interview, people said the same thing to me. And then one day, I was in the library uh, in, in Western New York, going through old newspapers, and, and I found um, this headline here um, from March 1966. It was a very small story, uh, but in it, uh, a school principal in Niagara Falls had reported to the city uh, that students on his playground were finding rocks that caught on fire. Uh, apparently, one of these rocks had caught fire inside the pants pocket of a small boy. And the top health official in the city of Niagara Falls at the time, a man named Ernest Gedeon, uh, was quoted in this story as saying he was concerned about the, quote, fire hazard. And, and, he, and he wanted people to know he was worried. And he also wanted to share a solution that he had to this problem. And, and his solution was as follows. He advised anyone finding the material, these rocks, to immediately submerge it under water or bury it. And you know, in all the crazy things and, 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 and ridiculous things that I unearthed, um, during th this research, um, this was so stark to me um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, you know, I live here in New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, as you can maybe see through the backside of my Zoom here, you know, I, I, I have some forest around me. And I can tell you for a fact that if my two children, who are two boys, 14 and 12, uh, found rocks out there in that forest that caught fire, um, they would not um, uh, bury it or submerge it underwater. They would think it was the greatest thing they ever found. You know, they, they would think this was a fantastic discovery. And, and the other thing that, that I think is important to note here is that these weren't actually really rocks. You know, it, the term was often used in the neighborhood fire rocks, but these weren't rocks. Rocks don't catch on fire. Uh, these were lumps of congealed chemical waste. That was what was catching on fire. So, you know, uh, uh, a series of poor decisions by multiple parties and agencies over the course of years and decades uh, has led to an unprecedented problem in the heart of an American neighborhood, 1,000 families, black and white, and then in 1977, 1978, these problems begin to emerge in ways that people cannot ignore any longer. And that is really uh, when the characters and, and, and this story in Paradise Falls emerge and begin to fight back. And I just wanna introduce a few of them to you now. Um, uh, the first I wanna mention here is, is a woman named Bonnie Casper. Uh, Bonnie's in the photograph here in the striped pattern shirt and the light slacks standing in the middle. Um, she was uh, 28 years old in this photograph, and, and she is not from Niagara Falls and not in the, a resident of this neighborhood. Bonnie Casper uh, is a, uh, a congressional aide um, for the newly elected congressman uh, from Niagara Falls, who is uh, standing uh, uh, two people to the right there uh, in, the, in the tie and the shirt sleeves. Um, that man in the tie is John LaFalse. Um, this photo is taken in 1978. John LaFalse at that point has been in Congress for three or four years, um, but he would go on to serve the city of Niagara Falls for three decades in Congress. And, and Bonnie has gone to work for John in Washington in the way that young congressional aides do. Uh, Bonnie has gone to Washington to change the world. And when she gets there, she realizes that's pretty hard to do, especially when you're working for a young green uh, congressman like John LaFalse. Um, he did not have plum committee assignments uh, or, or, or uh, sexy positions uh, inside the Capitol. Uh, John was a, a small time committee member on the um, banking and small business committees. Uh, and so it's not until June 1977 um, that Bonnie uh, has an opportunity 
Um, that month, uh, Bonnie Casper receives a phone call from a newly hired bureaucrat uh, working for the city of Niagara Falls in the wastewater treatment plant. And this man wanted Bonnie to know that he had uh, been out to the LaSalle neighborhood. He had uh, visited a school grounds there. He had seen with his own eyes chemical drums cresting out of the ground uh, around the playground. And, 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 and he needed Bonnie's help. Uh, he, he thought he needed about $400,000 to study and maybe solve this issue. And, it, and it's Bonnie who begins to uh, push this rock uphill. You know, uh, all summer, in the summer of 1977, trying to get John LaFalse to go and visit this property. And, and, and in, in September of that year, uh, John finally does go and visit. And, 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 and recognizes uh, the scope of the problem here. And, 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 and you know, over, over the course of my research, I did, of course, interview John LaFalse. He is still alive. And, and, and in my interviews with John, he said, you know, who you need to talk to is Bonnie Casper. And, and with his help, I did track her down. And, and Bonnie lives in the uh, DC metro area still today, uh, though she's no longer in politics. Uh, Bonnie is a real estate agent in Bethesda, Maryland. And, uh, you know, I, I found her and we spoke on the phone and, and then I went to, to meet her in, in Bethesda. And she told me before I went that she had kept a lot of things from this time in the way that many folks did. And she said, would you like me to bring some of my papers that I kept to, to the office? And I said, sure. And so, you know, I go and I meet Bonnie at her real estate office and I walk in the door and we go to this small side conference room and we walk in this uh, room and I immediately recognize that I've underestimated what Bonnie was talking about here because Bonnie kept boxes of, of material um, that she did give to me. And it was really only with this material, these internal memos inside John LaFalse's office uh, uh, that I was able to build out the early months of this problem before many residents even understood what was happening. There was another woman named Beverly Pagan. Um, you know, Beverly also was not a resident of Niagara Falls or of this neighborhood. Uh, Beverly lived in nearby Buffalo, about 25 minutes away. And, and here she was uh, a PhD level biologist. And also I think just as importantly, uh, Beverly was a mother. And, and, and Beverly had spent the 1970s doing uh, cutting edge research about a new idea. Uh, Beverly was writing scientific papers that connected uh, problems in the environmental world, like say smog or air pollution, uh, with lung disease or asthma. And, and she had also written papers in the 1970s that connected smoking cigarettes uh, with cancer. And so, of course, when problems emerge in, the, in this neighborhood in Niagara Falls, Beverly wants to visit, and, and she does. And, and in the summer of 1978, she begins um, running her own tests of the soil on this old canal, this landfill, this playground. And, and she begins to realize uh, or, or come to the determination that the problem that uh, extends much further than state health officials are willing to admit at that time. And, and, and Beverly begins to state these opinions first privately and then publicly. And, and, and when she does that, um, Beverly really puts herself in a very difficult position uh, because the lab that Beverly works for in Buffalo is at the university at Buffalo, a state university. And in fact, this uh, lab was affiliated with a place called Roswell Park, which actually fell directly under the umbrella of the State Department of Health. And so when Beverly begins to make statements that directly contradict health officials in Albany. Um, she's actually directly contradicting her own bosses. And, and Beverly begins to pay a price for that, a price that she actually knows she's paying at that time. And of course, you know, I did track down Beverly too. And uh, she lived uh, the last 30 years of her life uh, right here in New England, where I live. Uh, she lived in Bar Harbor, Maine, about four hours north of my house. And uh, I found her in late 2019 there. And in early 2020, just weeks before the pandemic hit, 
uh, I spent two days at Beverly's house up in Maine. And, you know, she was in her early 80s at that time, and her memory wasn't what it once was. Uh, but, uh, but in addition to the interviews, Beverly also had kept documents. As she told me um, uh, on my first visit there, uh, she said she had kept an entire file cabinet, four or five drawers, and maybe four or five boxes. Um, as it turned out, Beverly underestimated what she kept. Beverly had nine boxes of material related to her time at Love Canal. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps, than what she kept at her house in Maine was what I found uh, about Beverly elsewhere. You know, um, I, I visited the State Archives in Albany, New York, several times uh, for, for research for this book. And as you might imagine, there are thousands of documents at the State Archives uh, related to Love Canal. And, and when I go to a place like that, you know, I'm going with, with very targeted reasons. I know what I'm going to see. I know what I'm going to scan that day. I know what I'm looking for. Um, but when I do go to a big archive like that, I also, you know, will search for anybody I'm writing about, even tangentially, or any topic that's even adjacent to what I'm writing about, just in case. And, and so, you know, when I went to the state archives, I also, you know, searched for the names of some of um, the key folks in, in the neighborhood. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, in the history of the state of New York, there have been, you know, millions and millions of state employees. And, and, and not all of them uh, get a file at the state archives. But when I punched in Beverly's name, a file did pop up and it was labeled uh, Beverly Pagan Employment File. So I requested to see it, uh, which is you know, uh, an easy thing to do. Uh, but I was denied access to this file. I was told that it was a private matter, it was personal. So I did file a freedom of information request for Beverly's records. And then I waited nine months to get a reply. And finally, at the end of 2020, I received in the mail a disc that contained over 300 previously shielded pages related to Beverly Pagan's employment uh, with the state of New York in the late 1970s, between 1978 and 1980. You know, Beverly long believed during this window of time that she was being followed, um, that she was being watched. She actually thought that um, her phone line was being tapped. And, and she did report at the time in an official complaint that someone at work uh, was opening her mail and then resealing it. And, and I want to be clear, you know, in the records I received from the state of New York, I did not find specific evidence of those things. But what I can say and what I do know from those records was that uh, powerful men in Albany, New York, all the way to the doorstep of the governor, were watching Beverly. They wanted to know where she was and who she was talking to. Um, they were desperately worried about what Beverly Pagan had to say. There was also a woman named Aline Thornton. Uh, Aline uh, lived most of her life uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, Aline uh, was raised uh, just on the downtown side, the western side of the old canal in a public uh, housing development called Griffin Manor. She spends the tail, hood, tail end of her childhood uh, at Griffin Manor. Uh, she moves away briefly and then returns, Aline does, to raise her own children there. And, 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 and so, you know, when the problems begin to emerge in 1977, 1978, you know, Aline does what mothers do. Uh, Aline begins to connect the problems in the outside world to the problems in her own house. And, and she cannot help but think about her, her third child, a son, Gregory Thornton, who was born there at Griffin Manor in the LaSalle neighborhood in the 1960s, but would not live to see his second birthday. Uh, Gregory Thornton died in the 1960s there of leukemia. There was also a woman named Lois Gibbs, who many of you know, who's right here in this Zoom today. Um, and, and Lois lives on the other side of, of, of the canal, uh, the, the eastern side of the canal on 101st Street. Uh, and, and, and Lois and her husband, Harry, have moved there with her two, their two children, 
uh, Michael and Melissa, um, because they are claiming a, a piece of the American dream. Um, you know, they've, they've moved to this neighborhood uh, because it is a good place to raise a family. And, and they have a small house there on 101st Street. And, and Lois is happy there. Um, you know, Lois, uh, you know, uh, her husband works at the Goodyear plant. And, and she is what uh, they said at the time was a housewife, a stay-at-home mom. And, and Lois was the kind of stay-at-home mom who, you know, wasn't confident speaking out in groups, um, you know, speaking up at the PTA meetings or even um, teacher conferences. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and until things begin to change for her. In 1977, her son there, Michael, uh, begins to attend school uh, on that land, on that old canal in LaSalle. He begins to go, go to kindergarten. And, and by Christmas that year, uh, Michael Gibbs, previously healthy, is now suffering from seizures. And, and doctors inform Lois that this is just something that happens at times. And, and to be fair to doctors, it is. Um, you know, uh, seizures in, in, in a great many cases, especially with children, are what uh, doctors would call idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it. And, and Lois begrudgingly accepts this, uh, this diagnosis. Uh, until the spring of 1978, when she begins to read small stories in the Niagara Gazette um, that mention an old canal, an old landfill, chemicals buried in the ground, and some investigations that uh, authorities are doing there now. And, you know, um, Lois at that point does what uh, many parents would do. Uh, she goes to the school district and she makes a modest request. Uh, she simply asks uh, that in the fall of 1978, they move her son, Michael, to a different school, uh, given his health condition. And I often have wondered, you know, how this story might be different. Indeed, how this history might be different if the school officials had satisfied that request. Uh, but they did not. Um, as they told Lois, um, the school was safe uh, and her son would be fine. And Lois is now angry and begins to go out into the neighborhood, um, gathering signatures on a petition she has written with her own hand, um, asking simply that they uh, shut down the school uh, until they can learn more about what's buried there. And, and, and that summer, she gathers over 150 signatures on this petition, and she's ready to bring it to Albany to present to uh, health officials there. Um, when uh, they make a different announcement, an announcement that shocks her. Um, not only are they going to shut down that school, ultimately, um, they're going to recommend evacuation for the people living closest to the old canal, and then they're going to order evacuation for some 230 different families. And, 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 and yet, Lois's family is not one of those. In fact, more than 700 families would remain stuck living on the edge of an evacuation zone around an old landfill. And she will spend the next two years really uh, leading a fight uh, to escape their own homes. You know, a fight that, um, that will, uh, that for which she will also pay a great personal price at times. Um, and, and it is really Lois, more than anyone else, who pushes this story into the spotlight. And, and in the span of those two years, you know, um, does get the attention of the national media and the attention of John LaFalse, the governor of New York, Hugh Carey, and that man on the left there, um, Jimmy Carter. Um, in fact, uh, by October 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter will personally invite Lois Gibbs on stage with him in Niagara Falls, and he will say that day that were it not for Lois, he would not be there. And finally, there is Luella Kent. You know, um, it is Luella who will personally stare down Armin Hammer, uh, the man who sits at the top of Occidental Petroleum and Hooker Chemical. It is Luella, a mother of three in her early 40s, who will personally confront him. And you know, for me as a historian, that was actually fairly easy to, to confirm. Uh, there were um, news accounts of this confirmation, confrontation rather. Um, there were witnesses I could interview. And in fact, over the course of my research, I found a transcript 
of this confrontation that in of all places was housed at Columbia University in New York City. Um, but the story of the bird, the bird that died in the Wellis Creek, um, that, was, that was hard to confirm. You know, on, on all my uh, research trips to um, uh, Western New York, to the state archives, to the national archives, to many different universities, I found nothing uh, about a bird dying in a creek. And then one day I was right here in New England. I was just about 50 minutes from my house here in New Hampshire. I was at Tufts University, north of Boston. And I had gone there um, to spend the week uh, with Lois Gibbs's papers. And you know, when we talk about papers, we're talking about your memos, your letters, your mail that you received, the mail that you wrote, your notes, your journals, whatever you kept. And, and, and you know, Lois gave her papers to Tufts University many years ago. Uh, because they had given her an honorary degree there. And so, you know, of course, I want to uh, spend a, a lot of time with Lois's papers, and they are voluminous. And so I, I'm there at Tufts, I'm going through her, her papers, and I find two very thick file folders labeled daily status reports, daily um, uh, updates. These were reports uh, written by a man that some of you will recognize, another uh, uh, CHEJ uh, employee and leader. Uh, they were written by Stephen Lester. Um, Stephen was hired by the state of New York uh, in 1978 to serve as a consultant uh, for the homeowners of the neighborhood. There, there will come a point in this story where the residents of the neighborhood no longer trust the state health officials. They want their own experts. And Stephen is hired to be that expert. And uh, Stephen Lester writes these reports really as a way to document for the state of New York that he's doing his job, that he is doing uh, the work that he's getting paid for. In fact, at the top of each daily status update, it says work voucher daily report. And, and, and there were a lot of them. You know, Stephen uh, writes a couple hundred daily reports over the course of two years. Uh, there are three to four pages in length at times um, you know, with uh, written in dense scientific language, chemical readings, engineering sketches, you know, not at times the most interesting reading. But for me, this is gold because this is a timestamp. It's a timestamp written by a third party, an objective party, who was there, who was in the room, who was at the table, and then most importantly, uh, doesn't write down his thoughts 30 years later, he writes down his thoughts at the end of the day. So, you know, in late 2019, early 2020, I'm spending time at Tufts, uh, you know, I'm going through uh, Lois's papers, I'm going through Stephen Lester's uh, daily reports. I'm scanning them with my phone. My eyes are glazing over at times in the way uh, they do when you're doing hours and hours of this kind of research. You know, and I'm, and I'm often wondering, to be honest, what am I doing here in the library at Tufts? And then I get to the spring of 1979. And, and, and in the spring of 1979, inside Stephen Lester's daily reports, he begins to write that he is now going out into the neighborhood um, to do testing of soil at people's homes. And he's going, he says, with a second scientist. And this is familiar to me because of course, Luella Kenny had mentioned two scientists back there at the creek. And so now I'm, I'm reading very closely, I'm paying attention. And I, and I get to June uh, 1979, June 7th. 1979. Uh, it was a Thursday. Uh, it was warm and, and cloudy in Niagara Falls. Uh, a storm was moving in overnight. And in, in this daily report, uh, Stephen uh, begins as he always does. He logs his hours. At the top of the report, he says that he works on this day from 9 to 5.30. And in the opening lines, he, he, he notes that uh, they're doing remediation at the old canal. Um, the bulldozers are moving around. They're cutting down trees. They're putting up a fence. And, and, and then he writes that uh, he is going out into the neighborhood on this day with a second scientist. 
and he, and he's going uh, is gone to visit a home on 96th Street, 1064 96th Street. Um, we stopped at Mrs. Kenny's home at 1064 96th Street. She complained of chemical odors in the back of her home in the creek, which borders on the property. It was quite obvious that chemicals were indeed present in this creek. He misspells her name, you know, Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y, instead of K-E-N-N-Y. Because of course, Stephen Lester does not know Luella, but everything else he gets right. And then down at the bottom of the page, you know, in a file containing uh, 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 hundreds of pages, in a collection containing thousands of documents, uh, in a small room at Tufts that most people never visit, uh, Stephen Lester writes something that stops me. While we visited Mrs. Kinney, he writes, a bird which was feeding in the creek collapsed and died. And in that moment, you know, I, I knew a, a few things. Luella Kenny, she was telling the truth. Lois Gibbs, Beverly Pagan, Bonnie Casper, Aline Thornton, others, you know, they were probably telling the truth too. You know, I just had to uh, keep going, uh, keep uh, doing the interviews, keep finding the uh, documents, keep doing the work. You know, I was all alone in that library, uh, but I was on the right path. And, and I want to thank you so much for, for listening to me, and I'd be happy to take um, any questions you might have about this, uh, about the book. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Keith. That was amazing. Um, thank you, folks, for being with us today if you missed the intro um we are just really here celebrating keith's work uh we recommend that you purchase it from either your local bookstore um if you don't have it yet or uh through one of the links in the chat and caitlin please drop that uh link again in the chat i wanted to just say uh very briefly too that it's such an inspiring story uh, to me. Uh, I, I wasn't there then, but we work today with so many communities that are still going through some of the same struggles. So it's uh, a very current story, but it is unusual in that it, there were so many amazing leaders like uh, Luella, Lois, Patty, and so many others who were um, not named who really uh, brought that victory home and, and were able to inspire so many other people to continue uh, those types of campaigns and that type of work. And um, we're also recognizing part of the reason we, you know, we're having uh, Keith here today is to recognize May 21st as a really important historical date, which was um, the, uh, the second evacuation. So that is uh, a date that um, celebrates victory, it celebrates grassroots mobilizing and organizing, uh, celebrates the power of people working together to achieve a, a common goal. So for all those reasons, Keith, um, thank you for being such an amazing steward of the story. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Luella, I want to thank Patty, thank Lois, and all of those who made some really, really difficult choices back then um, to allow us to be here. With that, I'll, I'll open it up. I see there is one question here from uh, Paula in the chat. Uh, that is, what is the meaning of the sign about giving babies away with tea? If somebody could address that, I feel like we have some. Would any of you ladies like to take that one or we'll leave it up to Keith? Um, I, I can take it uh, uh, as best I know. So I, it, it, you can Google it, um, and and you'll find a, a number a number of different answers. It's an old it's an old saying. Um, I, I and and I'm I'm gonna sort of uh, probably get it wrong here, uh, but it's essentially. Uh, uh, it's it's to, to to use another sort of axiom to explain that one. It's a little bit like um, losing the forest for the trees or throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, you know, it's, it's, 
the meaning of it is uh, you're losing sight of what's important uh, while you focus on this other thing over here. That's my understanding. Google may disagree. I feel like if you had gotten it wrong, uh, some of the uh, some of my sisters here on this call might have corrected you very quickly. <laughs> Other questions or comments, just, uh, you know, if, uh, if you have, if so, seeing some of those pictures stirred up any old memories, Hunter, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Keith, in the middle, when you were describing Griffith Manor and the involvement of Agnes and it was Aline. Yeah, Agnes um, Jones and Aline Thornton, yeah. Yeah, you were mentioning the involvement of the NAACP. Did, did that ever pan out? I'm sorry, I haven't finished the book yet, but how involved did the NAACP even become like at that point? So um, to give some context to what Hunter's asking, so, uh, so Griffin Manor, again, was just on the downtown side, the, the Western side of the canal. Uh, this was desirable public housing. Uh, it, was, it was new and it was modern. And, and it had been built uh, recently, uh, refurbished recently, I should say. It had been there for decades, but it had been refurbished recently and was, was geared primarily for families. Uh, Griffin Manor were, were townhomes, condos, and apartments uh, that had three, four, five bedrooms. This, this, this is for large families, for kids, uh, and uh, had anywhere between 250 to 300 residents, uh, depending on you know, the time. Uh, and and the, the demographics of Griffin Manor changed over time. Uh, in the 60s, it was uh, actually a majority uh, white there. Uh, by the late 70s, it was about 60% black and 40% white. So still though, a very diverse um, public housing development. Uh, and uh, um, you know, many residents of Griffin Manor felt like the state officials we're ignoring them, uh, ignoring the potential health problems there. And, uh, uh, and so the NAACP did get involved in, in the, the fall and winter of 1978 into 1979, but they, they didn't um, really carry the baton for long, I guess, if that's what you're asking. It wasn't as if um, the NAACP set up and stayed, um, but they did, uh, they did, um, uh, get involved. They did assist residents there. They did assist Aline Thornton, um, and um, you know, tried to get the attention of state officials too. This is a question from the chat. Uh, could you talk about the role of Hooker employees and unions in the organizing? What tensions were there, and what collabor uh, collaborations? Yeah, well, Lois could certainly chime in on this too. Uh, so there are two, there are two aspects to, to that answer. Um, on the one hand, people defended Hooker, even within the neighborhood. Even people whose homes uh, were contaminated, even people whose homes were part of that first evacuation, some of those people defended Hooker. And, and, and you know, they did because they worked there or their father had worked there or their husband worked there or because uh, they were they had retired from there and they were worried about their pension. Um, and, and, and there are people in Niagara Falls that will still defend Hooker today. Uh, and so on the one hand, you have people uh, in a knee jerk reaction uh, defending Hooker. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, as this slow moving disaster played out over the course of many months and even a couple of years, uh, some workers in the city, uh, and I'm talking about factory workers, floor workers, um, people working on the edges of other hooker plants and other hooker um, uh, dumps rather within the city of Niagara Falls, um, became alarmed by what they were reading uh, in the neighborhood of LaSalle. And they began to worry about the hooker dump that was right next to their factory. And they began to worry about the noxious fumes that sometimes wafted in uh, from, that, uh, from that dump. 
and, and the own health problems that they have uh, as, as a result. And so um, unions uh, did, um, by 1979, uh, begin to organize to, to fight Hooker as well. Um, Lois and, and Beverly Pagan, and, and perhaps others here in, in the Zoom, did meet with them to try to give them a game plan. You know, and it's, it's interesting to me, and, I, and I, I would love it for Lois to address this, but, you know, you know Lois was doing the kind of um, community work even then, you know, that, that, that CHEJ has done now for four decades. Um, you know, she, uh, she, she didn't need to, to meet and uh, discuss uh, the problems that the union workers were having in another part of the city. Um, but Beverly and, and Lois did go do that and, and offered them a sort of um, a strategy that, that, uh, that, that Lois and Beverly had used. And um, in March, 1979, when Lois and, and Beverly would be invited to go testify before Congress and go testify before Al Gore's committee, um, they would be joined there by union workers. Yeah, Buffalo, just to add to that, Buffalo is a, in Western New York was a hugely union area, like everybody, there was auto industry, the chemical, everybody was in the union. If you weren't in the union, you probably weren't living there. You were, you were probably an import from somewhere else and needed to get, get a clue that unions matter. Um, and so, you know, the union was very supportive. All the unions were very supportive of all of our events and stuff like that. And, and um, you know, all of, our, all of our families worked in the industry. So, so beating up on Hook or beating up on Goodyear where Harry worked or beating up on NL where Norman worked with Luella, you know, doesn't do any good. What, what we had to do was, to, you know, we, we weren't in a plant, we were in a community. And our community had levels of chemicals that were higher than the plant where our men and women worked every single day. So, so you know, it was part of our, our, our background. And, um, and so, yeah, it wasn't a big deal, actually. I think, I think when we went knocking on the door, Debbie Cirillo was another one of the local leaders there. Debbie Cirillo and I knocked on the doors around the, the 99th, 97th Street First Circle. There was only one house that the person said, I can't talk to you because my husband works at Hooker. And, and if, I, if I talk to you, it, will, it won't be nice. And, and so, you know, because people understood, I get paid extra 25 cents to work for, on that chemical, or with that chemical in the plant. It's in my backyard. I know how dangerous it was. You didn't have to educate them. They were already educated, mostly by the unions about what the dangers were to these chemicals. And Patty knows a lot about this because Patty, Patty Grenzi lived on 99th Street. So she, she lived in the area. So when they evacuated in August 2nd, just pregnant women and children under two, they were across the street from Patty's house. And Patty was pregnant with her daughter, right? Or was it Matthew? No, your daughter, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the whole idea of that. So Patty, Patty wasn't going after Hooker Chemical. We were going after the state of New York, but we were making these arbitrary decisions based on political lines and cost benefits as opposed to chemicals and, and health risks to, to both Patty and her neighbors and, and her unborn child. Did I get that right, Patty? <laughs> we can't hear you. You're, you're on mute. Uh, um question is LaSalle still toxic today um <laughs> uh it's a loaded it's a loaded question and it's a loaded answer um so if you go if you go to the neighborhood today uh well let me step back for a second in the late 1980s uh about a decade after the problems first emerged the state of new york conducted a massive study uh, of the neighborhood, which by then was almost entirely empty of humans. And uh, they determined that the uh, homes on the downtown side of the canal and the northern side of the canal, so where Griffin Manor had once stood and where Luella Kenny's house had stood, uh, were, were safe and could be uh, habitable, uh, could be resettled. Um, uh, but they also determined in that same study that the, the canal itself and everything to the east of it um, 
uh, had levels of chemicals in the soil um, that made it unhabitable. And so if you go there today, uh, and, and when you drive in from uh, when you drive in from the south or you drive in from Buffalo and you go to Niagara Falls, you're going to cross over one specific bridge. And if you're going to go to the waterfalls in the tourist district, you make a left. And if you want to go to LaSalle, you make a right. And uh, it's only about a mile from there. And when you drive into the neighborhood, you'll still see on the downtown side, the small starter homes um, that had once you know, been there. They're still there. And they have been resettled, re, um, uh, reoccupied. Um, but everything uh, on the canal itself and, and everything to the uh, east of it is, uh, is empty. And you know, the question of whether it's still toxic today is up for some debate and still some litigation. You know, 40 years later, 40 years later, um, there is still pending lawsuits um, uh, related to the contamination at a place called Love Canal. And some of these lawsuits have been filed only in recent years uh, by people who have moved back into this neighborhood and back into some of those homes and have now had problems, health problems in their own families. And, and so, um, you know, uh, the problem uh, with chemical contamination uh, and, and this is a problem that uh, environmental groups, whether it's CEGJ or someone else um, faces, and certainly that residents face all the time, is that there's very little way to draw direct lines of correlations. You know, uh, is a child having seizures uh, because of the chemicals in the soil or is a child having seizures? Um, did, did a man die of brain cancer? because of the chemicals in the water or because he got brain cancer. And so um, sadly for residents of places like Love Canal, and as you know, in fact, better than I do, um, there are still places like this today um, in this country. Uh, these kind of residents struggle to make these arguments because um, for every argument they might make trying to draw that line of correlation to the problems they're having, um, there are holes uh, the size of, of a semi-truck uh, through which lawyers on the other side can argue the opposite. Actually, Keith, I was just diagnosed with something. It's a rare form of arthritis. It's called reactive arthritis. And according to the doctor, and I think I Googled it and according to them, it very well can be caused by environmental toxins. So that's something that's a given. Well, and this is, you know, and this is another sad thing, you know, again, that many of you here know, again, better than I, but, you know, as, you know, during my research and, and everything, I joined all those Facebook groups, you know, where, you know, growing up in uh, Niagara Falls or Survivor of Love Canal, Griffin Manor alumni. And, you know, every time this issue comes up on, on one of those, you know, um, um, social media posts and someone's, you know, says they have cancer or said they have a problem like this, you know, immediately people chime in and say, oh my gosh, you know, my dad had that too, or I have that too, or my sister has that. And, you know, and, and immediately folks think, it, it, you know, it, have to think that it's because of, of the, the lifetime or decades that they lived in this neighborhood. And that is, is, is just sort of a sad uh, legacy uh, of, 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 of this story. Yeah. yeah, I think that the saddest, one of the saddest things is that, um, you know, the, the government doesn't stand up for us. And they've tried to deny, I mean, all signs of chemicals have been removed from the fence that's around Love Canal itself. They put a playground next to the uh, 20,000 tons of chemicals that are still buried there. I mean, I was there one day doing an interview or something and, and here's a pregnant woman with her small child on the swings there. I mean, and, and, and they'll tell you that they believe what the government tells you. And unfortunately, we learned the hard way that you cannot believe that the government will lie to you constantly. And I think that somehow or another, we have to, to change that. And, and Keith, I'll tell you, 
I am so happy about this book because it verifies so many things with all the, the, the uh, in-depth research that you did, all of the things that we believed and we talked about all those years ago. So thank you, Keith. Thank you, Luella. And so to add one more thing to the question about health that Patty was talking about and Keith, there was a follow-up study done by New York State Health Department that looked at um, the community, I think it was 20 years later, is that right? I think it was, 20 I think it was 1996, yeah. Yeah, and what they found in that, in, in that follow-up study was, because we were really concerned about reproductive outcomes seeing that was so high, it was 56% birth defect rate um, during the time that we were living there, is they, they said that the reproductive outcomes for our children, so we're talking Michael, Melissa, we're talking Danielle, we're talking, you know, uh, Christopher and, uh, and so forth. So the reproductive outcomes for our children are occurring at the same rate as it was for the parents. So over 50% of our children's children are birth defected or, or have a problem. And, and so then the question was, do these chemicals, are these chemicals endocrine disruptors, chemicals that will change your genetics for generations to come. And the answer that New York State Health Department gave us is that we won't know until Melissa's child, for example, my daughter, until Melissa's child has a child, because it has to be three generations because Melissa spent some time at Love Canal. So the you know women are born with their eggs already in them. And so they have to wait until Melissa's child, who was not exposed at all to those chemicals, to determine whether or not it's, it's a, a genetic thing. And so the, the, the thing that was frightening to all of us, and this is when we took hostages actually, was that the whole concept of living in this community is not just about living there and escaping and counting your losses and moving on is that it could have impacts for thousands and thousands and thousands of communities across this country, impact in those families for generations. It can change the DNA of human beings. And it's just, that's just not right and not fair. I mean, to sit there and say, well, when Melissa's daughter, my granddaughter, Anna, she has a child that will tell us whether or not it's, it's, it's just wrong. Yeah. It's just wrong. And I think that's really the, the bottom line of this. This is not a story that goes away when, when we write a book and we tell the story and, and we move out. This is a story that is going to go on for generation to generation. And it's not just Love Canal. It's Houston, Texas. It's West Virginia. It's California. It's Arizona. It's every single state of the union. It's the Woolburn families. I see Frank Boulay is on here. It's the Woolburn families that that have been affected, or it's a it's the military families in North Carolina. It's not just today; it's generation and generation, and and that's the sad part of of this whole story and the whole crisis that we face as a nation, and we continue to face today. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that because there was a follow up study, and people should know also heart disease and urinary or uh, kidney disease. There were a number of things that were documented to be increased in um, La Fennel's children, and, and that's really kind of sad. It's not just birth defects. And that was so well put. Um, so many, I'm reading the chat here and, uh, you know, Marsha was talking about uh, Western PA, you know, and this, this whole concept of, well, you know, the, the company's bringing jobs and there's jobs and everybody needs jobs. It's like, okay, uh, in some cases, you know, you might get uh, a handful uh, of jobs created but really, I mean, number one, it is the, the company, you know, it's not like they're a, a social welfare organization, right? Their uh, companies are there to make money. So uh, the CEOs and the, those uh, executives are certainly benefiting more. And then the other, I mean, the fundamental question is, okay, when we bring it back to the health of a child or the health of you know, not just somebody's child, but somebody's grandchild and great grandchild. Um, you know, what are what are a few hundred jobs worth? And this is an argument that people have all the time. Um, there's a lot of blowback, I'm sure, 
that uh, uh, some of the leaders on this call can talk about so many personal attacks that they have gotten um, and how nasty that can be. Um, you know, people saying, wow, you're, you're going after our livelihoods, right? Um, when, you know, we know that we have to just pierce through that and it takes so much uh, courage and repetition and um, just, uh, I think, you know, good stubbornness to, to see these campaigns through. We had lots of that. <laughs> what, people talking bad about you, Patty? Well, we had, yeah, but I meant the stubbornness. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. That's the more important part, right? Yeah, well, you got to stick to it. Uh, Terry, just uh, you dropped a couple of comments. Just wondering if you wanted to say anything. You can unmute yourself on uh, the Zoom, if so. Well, I just I just want to repeat what I said. Uh, I commend all of the uh, mothers who are still with us and those who have passed on. Uh, they, they were real heroes, not only for their families, but for all the rest of us. Uh, their activism on Love Canal played a key role in the push to enact uh, unprecedented national legislation in the 70s. So uh, I thank those of you that are here today uh, for that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we got time for maybe one last question, and then we will adjourn for the day. Anybody got a last one or a last comment? I have a question if no one else is going to go. Please go ahead. Hold on, I think clear. Keith, you have a new fan. Uh, actually, this question I want to direct to Duella, Lois, and Patty, and whoever was present at. Love Canal. Does it ever get aggravating that Love Canal has become so much of your life that you can't just be like, hey, there's different parts. Let's move on with this. Does that ever happen? Like, has it just ever become like an elephant in the room of your lives? I've always, I was just really curious about that. Well, I can, in did I, yeah, I can answer that. For one thing, I have found that it's my passion and, and I cannot let it go because I'm working for the children and protecting the children of the future. And this is what's the important thing. And that's why this book is so important because it, it's about the educating people about um, what happens and what happened to us and it can happen to them and how to, how to break this cycle. It's, they, people need to be educated. You'd be surprised at how many people, when you mention Love Canal, they look at you like you have two heads. They have no idea what it is. And it should be part of his, the history. Um, it's not taught in a lot of schools. So children don't know. Therefore, the, the next generation is not going to know what to do or what to look for. So um, I'm, I'm happy about this book and the education part of it. But yeah, it, it's frustrating. I can't let go of it at all um, because it's a, it's a part of us. And like Luella said, we're still fighting for, you know, the children and people. And my husband, on the other hand, can put it like in the back shelf <laughs> and bring it out whenever he needs to or wants to. Um, I'm not that lucky. It's always there. I don't know, Patty. I think when he plays hockey, he's probably got somebody like Arm and Hammer's face on that puck when he's shooting it into the goal. I could just see Ernie doing that today. Um, yeah. This, I mean, this this was not Hunter. This was not my goal. This is not what I wanted to be when I grew up as a young child, as a young adult. Um, you know, I wanted to be a full time homemaker. I wanted six children, uh, and when everything was said and done, I wanted to work in a nursing home. Um, with a medical degree with seniors because seniors are, are one of my passions. And now that I am one, I, I'm in love with myself. What can I tell you? But, um, you know, life take, took me down a different path. And 
Um, and I think, I think the thing about what I wanted to do was always about helping. So I wanted to help seniors. I didn't want to do it because I wanted to be a medical person, right? I wanted to help people and, and, and seniors offer, um, and this is the parallel I'm making anyhow, <laughs> the seniors offer a lot of history, a lot of information, a lot of stuff, like they live through this shit, right? Uh, we're just reading about, it. they lived through it. They know what World War II, they know what the depression was. They know what it's like when you're a black woman and, and 1950 and 1960, they, they know this stuff. And, they, and so they were always so incredibly interesting to me, which is why my passion was in that direction. Well, now that I found myself in this work, um, it's really actually a mirror. It's just not all seniors. It's a, it's a, I have something to share. It's not a medical degree. I know how to organize. I, I'm a pretty good at strategy. I'm pretty good at a couple of things. Um, and I can share with people how we are able to accomplish that. So I have something to share. Um, and I, what I find most interesting is that every single community I've ever gone to has taught me something. Um, and it's just, it's just a, a, you know, an incredible experience. Um, I'm going down to Mobile next month uh, to Africantown. Africantown is where the, the last slave ship landed. And, and then the slaves of that ship created this town called African Town. They actually have the same culture they had when they were in Africa before people stole them and, and brought them here to America. But it's all surrounded by, it's in Mobile, Alabama. It's all surrounded by industry and they're being poisoned. And so, you know, what I can learn in Africa Town is just gonna be tremendous. I'm just really excited about that. So on one hand, I, 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 I can sort of let it go because I'm, I'm looking at it not as love canal, but looking at it, this is an opportunity for me to learn and experience and to share. And so, um, so I, you know, I really enjoy my life. I, I think that the, the path it took me down was exactly the right path. It wasn't seniors, although I still like seniors in Nella Day. I'm one I can just hang with them all. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, thank you. I guess being a senior has its perks that you get some grandkids to play with too. <laughs> Um, so listen, I just want to say thank you, uh, to Keith for being here with us today. I want to thank Luella, Lois, Patty, um, everybody else who was part of this amazing victory. Um, and thank you folks for sharing this time with us. If you want any more information, I highly suggest that you, follow CHEJ on social media, check out our website. If you're in a position to make a donation, we would love to have one. Uh, we continue this work on a regular basis um, with uh, amazing folks like Ms. Sharon Franklin, Ms. Caitlin Leventhal, Mr. Hunter Marion, so many others, uh, Stephen Lester, whom a lot of you know. Uh, buy the book, don't buy it from the evil empire, get it from one of your local bookshops uh, or online at one of the links provided here. Um, and I will see you very soon. Um, Claire Leahy is on this call. I wanna uh, send a special shout out to her because she is going through, uh, she's in one of these campaigns right now. And uh, we're going to stay in touch and we're going to keep this ball rolling. But thank you so much for being part of this talk today and have a wonderful rest of your day and stay safe out there. Thanks, thank everybody. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.